a deadly motorcycle crash closing part of I-91 North. Fox 61's Angelo Bavaro joining us as he works to get answers on what happened. Also, a former official calls out the Coast Guard Academy over the way it handled sexual assault allegations. She said she was forced to lie, and that's why she quit. We'll have more. Connecticut schools cutting back because their budgets aren't matching their needs. And now it's New Haven's turn to see how to erase a multi-million dollar gap. All local, all morning. This is Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. Good morning. Happy Tuesday. Thanks for starting yours off with us, America Arias. And I'm Tim Lammers. Yeah, that uh, motorcycle crash on I-91 North in Windsor looks like it just opened back up. Rachel Piscatelli is going to have more on that in the next couple of minutes. But we're going to start with the forecast as we get over to meteorologist Matt Scott. Good morning. Another good day, right? You know what? Listen, can you, can you improve on greatness? Sure. Kind of tough to do. Yeah. yeah. You could do it. You could try. We're not going to do it today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yesterday was... We set the bar pretty high. Today's good. Don't get me wrong. Still feeling fantastic out there. We have a mix of sunshine and clouds. Maybe, and I mean count them with one hand, one, five fingers, one, two, three, four, five raindrops. That might be it. We are going to build the temperatures over the next couple of days, building humidity, albeit slowly. We'll talk about that coming up. Satellite radar picture, it is fine out there with a the light wind out of the north. Northwest still dry, still comfortable with lower humidity levels. Temperatures ranging from 50 to 60. We got 50 in Wilmanic, 60 in New Haven, another 50 in Waterbury. Hartford splitting it right down the middle with 55 degrees. Here are your dew points even better than yesterday. This part we have improved on greatness. Mid to upper 40s to the lower to mid 50s at the shoreline, and that's the way it's gonna stay again throughout today uh, until we get a real strong surge of some southerly air. A little wind flow coming in out of the south and west. We're gonna keep that humidity level on the down low. 59 degrees now for the high schoolers, 73 later on this afternoon. I, I don't even want to say when the, when the students get off the bus because many of you under uh, final exams are getting out early, especially the high schoolers. So, uh, so that's for like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, not like noon. We'll talk about the forecast for the rest of the week coming up in a few minutes, 6.02. I, you know, I'm, I try to do what, what goes on in my family and try to apply it to mm -hmm. the school bus forecast for the rest of y'all. And that, that's where the brain is going. At yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah, so I'm assuming your kids have exams today? Yeah, mm. yeah. been fun in the household lately. Oof, I never, <laughs> never enjoyed that exam time, never <laughs> enjoyed that. Oh, oh, oh. And I certainly don't envy the students though. Mm. 602, almost 603 right now. We have an update to an earlier closure that we brought to you in our earlier hours at four and five o'clock, a portion of 91 northbound out by 37 and 38. That was closed this morning morning. It is now reopened, so we're starting to see things look a little bit better. This is described as a motorcycle crash. We know that there were serious injuries involved in this crash, but that is all we know at this time. This portion, though, of the roadway is now reopened for your morning commute. We have a crash on 95 over in East Lime this morning, out by 73 and 74. This is involving a tractor trailer and two vehicles. You can see those delays that are in the area because of that on 95. Of course, we'll keep you posted with another their update at 6:30. Back to you. Okay, Rachel, uh, as she was saying, uh, at least part of I-91 North in Windsor is back open right now following that motorcycle crash. It was between exits 37 and 38. They had the whole highway shut for hours as crews investigated. Yeah, and this is just the latest in a string of motorcycle crashes in recent weeks. Fox News wants Angelo Bavaro is joining us live right by the highway in Windsor with the very latest. Angelo, good morning. Erica, Tim, good morning and things back open around here. Traffic moving just fine. We also just got an update from Connecticut State Police about exactly what happened here. Some more details. They say this was reported as a crash involving a motorcycle around 1120 last night. And this did result in some serious injuries. That is all they are telling us. And this incident, as you said, really marking a pattern that we have been seeing this month. Just a few days into June, it has been a deadly month for motorcyclists across the state. So we have counted at least eight deaths so far in six motorcycle crashes. According to the state DOT, speeding is a significant contributor to these traffic deaths. The DOT says more than 50 motorcyclists lose their lives on Connecticut roads each year. In 2022, there were 65 motorcycle deaths. That is the highest number in over 35 years. 
and the DOT offering these reminders for both drivers and motorcyclists to stay safe on our roads. Always check your blind spots. Make sure that you maintain an adequate following distance behind motorcycles. Always follow the safety protocol for intersections. So that means coming to a complete stop, obeying those posted traffic signs, and also looking both ways and watching for turning motorcycles, especially on those left turns. So you want to take a second look for approaching motorcycles before you cross a lane of traffic to turn left. Again, all we know at this point, serious injuries involved in this crash that happened last night. Don't know what exactly led up to that, the cause of the crash. Of course, as we get more details from state police, we'll pass those along to you at home. You're live in Windsor this morning. I'm Angela Lopafaro, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. All right, Angela, thanks so much for the update there. Well, meantime, a Norwich man is accused of a deadly hit and run in Griswold. Police say 35-year-old Franklin Post sped through a stop sign and slammed into another car with three people in it and then took off. Now, this happened Sunday afternoon. Charlotte DeGrado from Brantford was in the back of the other car. She was brought to the hospital where she died. She was just days away from her 97th birthday. According to surveillance video, three men jumped out of the car right after the crash, grabbed a few things, and then took off. And a 10-year-old is recovering after being hit by a car in Simsbury. It happened at the intersection of Elm and Church Streets Sunday afternoon. Police say the child was in the crosswalk when they were hit. The driver immediately stopped to help the child. The 10-year-old was taken to the hospital and is expected to be okay. I knew this morning uh, the Hartford Police Union has called on Police Chief Jason Thody to resign. Officers in the union said they're fed up with a policy that requires them to work on their days off. The union said the policy has been in place for about three years, even though it was only supposed to be implemented on a trial basis. We're told officials planned a hearing to discuss the matter in April, but that the chief delayed it twice without the union's okay. The union also took aim at Thody's leadership and blamed him for low morale. It's just the latest sign of displeasure from the union. Members also voted no confidence in Thody back in 2021 and then criticized him last year about concerns about officer recruitment and retention. Thody announced plans to retire in March, but is still on the job as of right now. And we are still waiting for Thody's reaction to this uh, latest statement from the union. It is 6.07 this morning. Today, state leaders are going to head to Washington, D.C. for a hearing on the Coast Guard Academy's Operation Fouled Anchor. Yeah, this is the investigation into the Academy's mishandling of sexual assault reports for decades. And an admiral accused of being a big part of the cover-up culture is expected to testify. Yeah, this hearing comes two days after another official said she quit because she was forced to lie to survivors. Fox 61's Brooke Griffin is live at the state capitol with more on the allegations. Good morning. And good morning to you. That hearing today in Washington, D.C. is going to feature testimony from a top Coast Guard official. She's one of many people that have been questioned since that cover-up allegation came to light last summer. Now, last summer, it was revealed that the Coast Guard Academy had covered up an investigation into mishandled sexual assault reports from 1990 all the way up to 2006. This report was called Operation Fouled Anchor. Since then, survivors have come forward saying they were told something would be done when they reported what happened to them, but nothing ever was. The Coast Guard has traditionally punished people when they came forward to report assault. This in response to that victim admitting to underage drinking or being out past curfew when that assault happened. The Academy is the only branch of the military to still not have protections in place. Senator Richard Blumenthal has, has been outspoken on his disgust of this matter, saying that he will head to D.C. today to oversee See the hearing where Admiral Linda Fagan will testify. Blumenthal has said before that he hopes these hearings do right by the victims. And the Coast Guard has responsibility for the disclosure, full and accurate truth telling to the American public and to Congress about this chapter in its history. Operation Fouled Anchor was truly foul, but concealing it only made it worse. 
And to further the damaging information coming out in this case, a Coast Guard official in charge of sexual assault response, Shannon Norenberg, has resigned. She said that her job was to speak with victims, but she didn't realize that her findings were actually being withheld from Congress. Norenberg said in a statement she didn't even find out about Operation Found Acre until four years after it began. Now, she says that she was told to make rounds, apologizing to survivors in an attempt to try to help them feel heard. Norenberg also says she was ordered to withhold VA and mental health service options from survivors so that Congress wouldn't find out. She said in a public resignation letter that she is not willing to be an unknowing accomplice any longer. We've reached out to the Coast Guard Academy for a statement on the matter of the whistleblower accusations of being lied to by the Academy about the impacts of her job description, but have not currently heard back. And Senator Richard Blumenthal is expected to be here at the Connecticut State Capitol later this morning before he heads down to Washington, D.C. I'll be speaking with him this morning about what is next in this investigation and what they hope to see from that hearing. We'll have more on that later. Live in Hartford, Brooke Griffin, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. All right, Brooke, thank you for that report. Certainly a lot to get to there, so we appreciate it. Well, it's 611 and this morning the New Haven School District is still trying to close an overall $11.8 million budget deficit and they're trying to do it without cutting teachers or important services for kids. Now, for the last few years, many Connecticut school districts have been relying on COVID era federal funds. Yeah. That's money that's no longer there. New Haven superintendent says she's looking at every possible option when it comes to making cuts and saving money, including possibly combining bus routes or cutting third party partnerships. I have no doubt about that, that even in the struggle, we are going to be on top of our game and continue to do what we know best, which is teach our children. Now, the Board of Ed did come up with a mitigation plan that primarily uses grants to cut the deficit down to $4 million, but they're still trying to find more funding to close the gap further. They did say, though, the mitigation plan would cut the number of layoffs down from the 61 that they initially estimated.